welcome to Europe Debates. I'm Richard Milsom, the Executive Director of the European Conservatives and Reformist Party in Brussels. And today we're greatly honoured to be joined by an excellent panel of leading politicians and experts from both sides of the Atlantic in order to discuss the EU-China investment deal. At the end of 2020, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen announced the EU had reached an agreement with China on the creation of a new comprehensive agreement on investment. The new agreement will see China given unprecedented access to the EU's financial markets, beyond that which is ever offered to any other country. From access to Chinese workers, to the ability to join research and development projects, the communist state has been given a high degree of access. However, the agreement comes against the backdrop of rising tensions between the EU and China, with mounting accusations of human rights abuses against minority groups, including the Tibetans, Christians, Uyghurs and pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. In the case of the Uyghurs, the United States took the bold step of declaring China's actions against them a genocide, with over two million Uyghur people in internment camps and millions more transported around the country as forced labor. Critics have stated, have stated text of the investment agreement fails to address these labor and human rights concerns. Now, this is a big topic and we've only got one hour to discuss. Uh, broadly, I'd like to do this in three sections. Uh, round one will be the implications for labor and uh, human rights. Round two will be the economic interests. And round three will be the transatlantic and global implications uh, of this deal. Uh, now, this webinar is live streamed across multiple social media platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and on our website. We're very grateful for the many people that have registered and will be following this debate live. So please do use the comment section to ask intelligent questions, which I will try to relate to the panel if, uh, if time allows. So without further ado, let's get it started. And firstly, we are delighted to be joined by Mrs. Anna Fotiger. Uh, Anna Fotiger is a Polish member of the European Parliament, the Secretary General of the European Conservatives and Reformist Party, who before becoming a member of the European Parliament, served as the Polish Foreign Minister. So Anna, perhaps to get us uh, started, Ursula von der Leyen recently tweeted that this agreement will uphold EU interests and promote EU core values. And the CAI, the investment deal, provides the EU with a lever to eradicate forced labor. Is this wishful thinking? Oh, well, I, th I think that uh, despite all efforts uh, until today, we were not uh, particularly successful in er eradicating uh, a wave of, of uh, violating human rights uh, by the PRC. Um, actually, CAI, so the investment agreement, has been negotiated for seven years. And seven years ago, China was, uh, uh, China's uh, behavior in, uh, on the international scene uh, was uh, quite different. Now the country became with the uh, policies of Xi Jinping. Uh, um, much more assertive. Uh, the agreement, um, according to, to, to all uh, expertise, is, is uh, too weak in terms of, of uh, um, uh, human rights, in particular uh, forced uh, laborers and and actually using using uh, people who are highly intimidated being highly intimidated in uh, for example Xinjiang province we have uh, other issues uh, as as well um, the, the capital punishment uh, in China we have uh, extremely aggressive attitude vis-a-vis uh, vis opposition uh, leaders in the country. We have very aggressive uh, um, uh, approach to, to, to Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan and, and uh, uh, Tibet. So, so we have really many issues. There are other concerns, uh, of course, I'm sure that my colleagues are, are going to, to, to talk about this. So, so I leave them also the floor to, to do this. Uh, I, I've been watching the human rights situation in China and, and uh, the attitude of China vis-a-vis -vis neighborhood. And, 
for many years already. It is not only the concern of uh, transatlantic uh, community, it was my own per, uh, interests and engagement in the parliament. And I'm truly worried about this agreement. I think that it emboldens uh, China to, 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 to move further. Well, thank you very much, Anna. There's uh, plenty of stuff we can pick back up on uh, 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 on that. Um, let me now bring in Miriam Lexman, who is a member of the European Parliament from Slovakia, uh, sitting with the European People's Party, who was first elected in 2019. Uh, Miriam, before taking her seat in the European Parliament, she was the European Director of the International Republican Institute. Uh, we've worked with Miriam for many years. She's a great expert in foreign affairs and a steadfast campaigner for human rights and democracy across the world. We're very proud to call you our friend and very grateful for your participation today. So thank you very much, Miriam. Um, perhaps sort of an opening one to get us started. You know, we now have EU sanctions against Russia over the Navalny affair, but nothing against China. Should the EU be consistent in its approach, in its approach to human rights violations? You're muted. Can we, we can't hear you. Miriam? Yes, sorry, I forgot to ah, unmute gotcha. my mic. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, very timely event. Uh, I think it's uh, absolutely vital that we will disc we discuss the consequences of the investment deal with China. We have uh, some months ahead of us to discuss it. The European Parliament should scrutinize it. And I am one of the voices who call for a very thorough and in-depth scrutiny. Uh, I'll put the, the question in a kind of larger context a little bit. As you mentioned, I work for the International Republican Institute and six years ago we have started to work on a project which was looking at, uh, into uh, disinformation foreign influ influence of our democracies. And uh, except of Russia, we were pointing out in our studies and analysis, we're looking into the increasing uh, manipula manipulative approaches from China uh, within the European Union and within the democratic world, also the Western Balkans, the Eastern Partnership countries. And we were pointing out to this, but unfortunately the international discussion about foreign influence and disinformation was very narrow, focusing on Russia and maybe some domestic players. And China was completely ignored. And I, I remember uh, at a very high level conference, there was a, there was a, a think tank expert and I was saying that how dangerous it is that the totalitarian communist regime as China or the Communist Party has uh, direct access to our, uh, our media, is, is trying to influence through media our, our public opinion. And the answer was that China is not ideology. China's only interest is to, is to extend its economic deals and, and economic prospects. So I, I was largely shocked. Then um, the COVID a year ago came, which has revealed the enormously dangerous situation we are vis-a-vis -vis China, because they are not only manipulating our, our public opinion, they're able to bribe and influence the, the high-level diplomats and our ambassadors to China, the, the commission decisions. And this is really boring situation also, uh, manipulate or, or blackmail our countries uh, through our economic dependency on a very crucial material like the healthcare uh, material at the, at the COVID, but uh, but also I mean other other uh, products. And coming back now, amid all this, we strike the deal with China, which would extend our economic uh, cooperation. But at the same time, we are able to. Uh, come up with the Magnitsky uh, fi after, I don't know, six, seven years of discussing it, the, the Magnit European version of the Magnitsky Act, but we are unable to use it. And I think this is a, this is a really a big uh, failure. Today, I was receiving a couple of emails from Hong Kong activists asking when is the European Union starting to, to use the Magnitsky Act? And my answer is, I don't know. I mean, the European Parliament is bringing up, we have already proposed a couple of lists of names of people who we believe through our contacts should be on the, on the, uh, on the sanction list. And unfortunately, this is not happening. And we know that the human rights abuses in China are growing. 
the Conservative Human Rights Commission of the British Parliament has uh, issued a report on the human rights uh, situation in China. This report brings really appalling records of the situation of human rights in, in China. Richard, you have mentioned already the Urkus, but the, the, this doesn't stop there. I mean, it's the Christians, it's people of uh, many different faiths, but also the political opposition, but also people who just want to fight for their right at the moment when it's violated. It's, uh, so this regime uh, is really increasing its pressure against its own population. The, the report of the uh, human rights, Conservative Human Rights Commission is called the darkness deepens because a couple of years ago they have issued a report which was called the darkest moment because one of the human rights activists has mentioned that the situation is is uh, uh, as bad as was uh, during the Tiananmen Square pressure or oppression. And now they were thinking of how to name this report because the reports practically show that the situation since then has even worsened. So practically that's why it has this, uh, this name. And I think that this is a complete failure of uh, our, I would say, value-based policies and, and, and gives a slap into that, the values we have got because the EU in our treaties clearly says that the uh, that the values which brought the member states together should be pursued in our foreign policy. And if we strike the, the biggest economic deal with a country where the human rights situation is at the darkest moment, I think this is a failure. And the kind of arguments that through this economic cooperation we can improve the human rights situation, I think has already proven completely uh, as a failure because naively, uh, I would say in the 90s, the European Union saw that through economic engagement with Russia or other countries or semi-totalitarian or, or undemocratic countries, we can uh, push for improvement of the human rights and uh, democratic structures in the countries. I think now we, we learn the lessons that these countries are able to use our money in order to support their regimes. And I think this is the failure we are doing, that we are trying to still manipulate our own believes that we are still helping through economic cooperation, but we do exactly the, the, the opposite. Thank you. And thank you very much, Miriam. And it, you know, it's, uh, you know, my fear in this is that, you know, the, the commission in pursuit of this deal will be prepared to uh, allay some of these concerns and, and not address them in the way that they should in the pursuit of the deal at a time when we, we should be keeping up as much pressure as possible. Uh, to try and change the situation. But thank you, Miriam. Uh, let me now introduce you to Theresa Fallon, who uh, it's the first time she's with us on one of these Europe debates, so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Theresa is the founder and director of the Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies at CREAS in Brussels. Uh, she uh, concurrently is a member of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific, a non-resident senior fellow of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, a junk professor at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies, and a member of the SEPS Task Force on AI and Cybersecurity. Wow, I don't know how you do all of that. <laughs> uh, Theresa's current research is on EU-Asia relations, maritime security, global governance, and China's Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and a great and great power competition. She's testified on numerous occasions to the European Parliament on the Committee for Foreign Affairs and the Subcommittee on Security and Defence, uh, and is often featured in European international media. So, Theresa, thank you, thank you for being with us. Uh, perhaps just building on this, um, can China be persuaded to sign the International Labour Organization Convention as part of this? Let me just take you off mute. Mm. No, still haven't got you. I can't hear you. Can you hear us? We'll just try at our end. Teresa, I think we will have to come back to, to Teresa. Um, okay, right. Dr. Azim, Dr. Azim Ibrahim, who is the director of the uh, New Lines Institute for Strategic Policy, for Strategy and Policy. Uh, Dr. Azim has been with us before, so welcome back. Uh, he completed his PhD from the University of Cambridge and serves as an International Security Fellow at the Kennedy School of Government 
Harvard and a World Fellow at Yale. Over the years, he's met and advised numerous world leaders on policy development and ranked as a top 100 global thinker by the European Social Think Tank and a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. Dr. Ibrahim is uh, also the author of The Rohingyas Inside Myanmar's Hidden Genocide and Radical Origins, Origins Why Are We Losing the Battle Against ex Islamic Extremism? So, uh, Dr. Azim, you recently wrote a report on the coercive labor in Xinjiang. Can, indeed, will China change its approach and labor laws in light of potential trade agreements with the US and the EU? Well, thanks so much for having me, Richard, and thanks so much to my esteemed colleagues, um, uh, Anna and Mariam, um, uh, who've made very salient points. So, in terms of your question, will China change its behavior? Uh, this economic deal that Europe is uh, signing up uh, with uh, with China, I can understand the motivation behind it. Uh, you know, after the Trump administration, Europe has decided to enact what they call strategic autonomy and not be reliant on the U.S. and the Republican voters um, uh, for their security and economic dependence. Hence, they are looking elsewhere for partnerships. And uh, China, obviously, being the the, the fastest growing economy in the world, one of the biggest economies, is is, is an actual partner. But this is much, much beyond just economics. This is actually more to do with geopolitics. And I think in this sphere, Europe is making a mistake of historical proportions by trying to um, uh, trying to come to some sort of agreement with China. So in terms of your question, will China agree to these international labor organization and other treaties? They certainly would, but the, abs the, the probability of enforcing any of these agreements is, prob is next to zero. Uh, you know, Western companies, Western uh, observers will have absolutely no access to China as they, as they do at the moment. They have no access whatsoever to Xinjiang and the labor camps. And uh, any edicts that may arrive from the ILO or other institutions will simply be ignored. And uh, Europe, on the other hand, will simply be quite happy to brush them under the carpet as well, uh, as they have done. So even at this particular moment, you can see um, uh, you know, countries like Germany have got huge plants in Xinjiang with Volkswagen and other entities are just very qu quietly able to ignore all of the edicts that will come out from various institutions and human rights bodies and so on. Um, uh, so much of this is just window dressing uh, for Europe to try to secure a deal because Angela Merkel in particular is looking to uh, China for the post-COVID economic recovery. You know, here is a country that they, ex they export over 50% of their cars to, uh, so absolutely critical to the German economy. So looking at short-termism for uh, and compromising their long-term strategic um, uh, position. And the reality is, Richard, is that, you know, countries, we, and, and there is a very clear track record of this. There is absolutely no ambiguity on this situation now whatsoever that countries that are aligned on China, even a very small bit, are, have to be fully on board with the Beijing project, have to be fully on board with the China project. Otherwise, they are punished mercilessly, not just um, uh, online by trolling, but some actual economic um, uh, punishment. Uh, countries will withdraw, China will withdraw contracts, will withdraw investment from those countries uh, that, that step out of line. And so this is a, a reality that we have to consider when discussing any sort of trade deal with China is that you are essentially now getting into bed with an authoritarian, uh, a ruthless authoritarian regime whose purpose it is to dominate the global economics. They are engaged in what you know can only be described as uh, uh, economic colonialism, uh, getting countries into huge amounts of debts. Countries that were in the that in many occasions don't need that kind of level of investment, don't need that kind of infrastructure, um, but they are getting into uh, getting into debt with China, who then translates that debt into economic power and starts taking over national assets. And these countries essentially become satellite states. And I would just like to final point I would like to make is that one of the most significant trends that we are going to see over the next few decades is actually the economic stagnation and possible economic decline of Europe. You know, the European Union in the 1980s constituted about 30% of the global economy. In 2020, which is essentially now 2020, 2021, it's about 16%. It's gone down dramatically, almost halved. By 2050, it is going to be about 9% of the global economy. Europe is in economic decline. And by becoming reliant on China, for its economic uh, development, for its economic growth, you, they are essentially becoming will become nothing more than a satellite entity of Beijing to control as it wishes. 
in 10 years time there'll be three major economic blocks around the globe there'll be united states china and possibly india the european union will not even figure within that block the european union will essentially become an extension of beijing so the eu leaders have to decide now what side of the equation they want to come on uh, the us side the western side or do they want to become part of the china the china block because that is the only question that has to be answered at this moment yeah thank you very much Azim. i mean it's um I'd hope to have Bernard uh, Greta, a Frenchman, he hasn't managed to join us, uh, to talk about the fact that, you know, it's perhaps France and Germany that stand to gain the most from this agreement. Uh, but how much economic gain justifies, you know, condoning human rights abuses in China? Um, and unfortunately, I think that, uh, you know, such is the desire, such is the pressure, um, that, you know, they're prepared to turn a blind eye and to you know, also impact uh, other partners, you know, across the, the rest of the dem democratic world who have, like the UK and the US, put tangible measures in place to try and improve the, uh, the human rights situation there. So it's a difficult one. Anyway, um, hopefully Teresa will be able to rejoin us at some point. Um, but let's move on now to the sort of the, the sort of economic interests. Uh, and perhaps Miriam, I could come to you first. Um, like I said, France and Germany have the most to gain, but many smaller EU member states already run a trade deficit with China. And won't this just widen the gap? I mean, I'm speaking specifically for you in, in, uh, in Slovakia, but uh, across the smaller states, are you going to end up with a higher trade deficit with China? Thank you very much, Richard, for the question. I believe so, and I think we are heading into the situation, and we don't need to, because I think what instead of uh, uh, kind of hiding behind the wording that we are trying to, with this deal, with the trade investment with China, we are trying to kind of push for a level playing field for our companies that they are not kind of on an equal footing with the Chinese companies and this is our aim. I think that we all know that we are going to fail, that practically the deal doesn't extend really the level playing field for our companies, but maybe sets the status quo. Uh, and secondly, I believe that uh, innovative and, and value-based approach would be that we're not striking any deal with China, but we are trying to figure out what the economic possibilities for trade deals they are with the democratic part of the world. I think this is our moral responsibility and it's a responsibility for the safety and uh, and democracies in our own countries so first of all yes we are failing to, to defend uh, human rights or kind of ignoring the human rights situation we are ignoring the labor laws which we are claiming that we are actually i will mention here that the arguments coming uh, which are kind of arguing for the the investment deal are saying like yes but we can still at least push for the for for the better uh, adjustment of the labor laws. I mean, we know that the deal uh, with uh, with South Korea was actually having the same wording, uh, which did not put any duties on the South Korean side to improve the labor law. And now we are failing short to push for a better conditions of the labor law. So we have already an example that this language is practically weak and doesn't give us any instrument to push for a better situation. Secondly, we be, I believe that we are not going to improve the situation of, of the companies as such, maybe a few, some, which uh, uh, obviously, I mean, we, there are some allegations to whom and to what companies this deal is serving. And I'll mention one thing, because we are also saying or arguing for the, uh, for the, the their arguments for the investment deal is that it will, uh, it will, uh, defend the companies and prevent their the, the, the pressure from the China to uh, transfer their intellectual property uh, when in, uh, involving in a, in a deal, which probably legally might be true. But the problem is that our companies, most of the companies are facing another issue. It's practically that their property is stolen by a Chinese company. They are sealing an anti uh, injun injunction in our court, the, the Chinese company bring it to, to the Chinese court. The court in Wuhan has actually, I mean, there is a case of uh, interdigital against Xiaomi, where I have heard of, where practically the, the court in Wuhan has issued an anti-anti-suit injunction, 
which practically means that our companies are losing enormous revenues and there is no protection for these companies. So practically, in, in long sentence or in long answer, I, can, I, can, I believe that this is unfortunately not going to improve the situation of our companies and it's actually making our debt vis-a-vis -vis China even, even deeper and, and in, will increase the Chinese possibilities to manipulate us through our economic dependency. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, it's, it's interesting. It kind of leads on to the next one, the question I was going to ask Anna, that, you know, is there a risk that Chinese research and development in Europe will be focused on military and surveillance and this kind of dual-use technology that basically they take back home and could potentially use against us? Can you unmute? Yes, yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, certainly uh, very, very important question. Thank you. Uh, I would like to echo um, uh, uh, Miriam in one uh, thing in particular. Many colleagues uh, argue that this deal improves uh, uh, the situation of European companies, European business uh, on a Chinese market. But ben? actually, but actually, within the CAI agreement, there is nothing about protection of investment later on after opening of, of the market. And uh, experience until now is uh, certainly very bad uh, in this respect. We know, uh, just referring to your question, uh, how strong China PRC produce uh, uh, civilian military fusion in in uh, uh, state uh, policies and and actually many endeavors that for for general public in uh, the EU seem uh, uh, benign and 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 business like is to to enhance also. Uh, expansion, uh, potential infiltration of, of uh, our societies. Miriam was speaking already about uh, Chinese uh, propaganda. It was particularly visible and uh, um, easy to detect during the COVID-19, uh, enhancing uh, the, the perception of, of a positive perception of China on, uh, on, uh, in, in the, within the EU. But now we have to know that there are areas uh, that are extremely well operated by China already, and this deal gives reciprocity. It's, it's not only improving our, our uh, position and our role. When we speak about uh, 5G, it, it, uh, it is already quite dangerous in terms of, of uh, uh, the Chinese penetration of many areas uh, of other, our, our life. Uh, uh, so just a few years ago, it was it was well known in Poland that very high-ranking uh, counterintelligence official has been uh, uh, simply working uh, for 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 um, uh, Huawei and 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 therefore for for Chinese uh, probably military. Uh, intelligence so it we have many cases uh, like this but there is also one uh, important uh, topic that uh, we already know how uh, what what uh, kind of pattern the prc pursues in for example taking over companies or boards of of uh, companies in, for example, Hong Kong after imposing of, of uh, uh, the national uh, security law. And, and uh, how, much, uh, how much pressure on, uh, let's say, political behavior 
that uh, that is beneficial for Chinese interests has been already put in place on the EU territory. I would like to 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 add uh, maybe just one more passage that uh, in. Uh, um, 2018, we, we could indicate only one country within the EU having a positive trade balance uh, with China. It was uh, Germany. And, and I'm, I'm afraid that uh, current uh, um, balance, uh, uh, for example, in Poland, after after uh, all endeavors, after 17 plus one, uh, the the Chinese exports is ten times bigger than uh, Polish exports to, to to China. So it is it is uh, how those agreements work for for example our part of of. Uh, of the EU for, for Central and Eastern Europe, but many countries are in a similar situation. And one more thing, we still remember mobility package, mobility two package, discussion, difficult discussion about uh, services uh, and in, in within the EU and attitude of one member state vis-a-vis workers of another or, or um, uh, services providers of another member states with uh, CAI we agree to to to, to uh, invite to Europe large number of of uh, transferees uh, for of um, Chinese uh, workers coming and being able to, to work as long as three years for, for Chinese subsidies according to CAI. There is also the provision for, for, for business visitors, but that is uh, another issue. So we have problems also in terms of purely economic and, and relationship between parties. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Anna. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on to the labour uh, issues, uh, you know, Chinese workers in, in Europe in just a second. But I just wanted to pick up on the 5G thing. And I, perhaps uh, uh, a question for Dr. Azim. You know, given that Huawei is guilty of using its mass surveillance and ethnic profiling in Xinjiang, can they be trusted with 5G in Europe? So, uh, one of the biggest things that China fears, Richard, is uh, not that the US is going to, as, as many people like to portray, the US is going to invade the country or, or take over or something. One of the things that they fear the most is that, you know, the economy will slow down and there will be a popular uprising against the regime and people will start asking questions. What's happening in Xinjiang with the, with the Uyghurs is essentially uh, not just a process of signification as articulated by Xi Jinping himself personally, but it's also a large test laboratory in terms of how do you use the most cutting edge technology to control a very large population using surveillance and monitoring and all sorts of other uh, high tech facilities. 5G is an absolutely critical part of that. And what, now that they have mastered this technology, we are seeing that they are exporting this around the globe. Uh, countries like the uh, Philippines, countries like uh, Myanmar, even most recently, have imported some of this technology to try to control their population. So the, the entire Chinese technology sector is subsidized uh, co um, through corporations like Huawei to the tune of tens of billions of dollars uh, that Western companies cannot compete against because of the, just the sheer level of subsidy. And it's all designed to ensure that you know they are able to have this technological edge and they are now interested in exporting this technology. So the whole Huawei debate was very interesting simply because, you know, we have seen multiple cases now of uh, countries that have imported this technology that are then under highly questionable uh, facilities that they, the Chinese actually developed for them. The African Union was a case study in which you know, the servers would turn on in the middle of the night and uh, data was being exported to China. The same case happened in Pakistan as well with the traffic control system. So countries... Uh, participate in these technological um, uh, 
transfers at their own peril, considering what the case studies have actually shown. Super. Thank you so much, Dr. Azim. Now, I see we've got Teresa back. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Well done for working it out. <laughs> so, uh, Teresa, um, so we're on the sort of the economic interests here. And, you know, we've seen examples of segregation, controls on personal lives, unfair dismissals um, for people working in Chinese companies. Can we trust that these Chinese companies to follow EU practices when they are allowed to come over here under this new agreement? First of all, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really delighted and honored to be with this um, very impressive panel. Uh, my teenage son, I had to thank him for helping me get back up. I don't know why it froze like that, but thanks to his help, I could uh, address it. I'll, I'll just quickly address your first question before the computer cut out uh, about ILO. Um, I am sorry I didn't hear the other respondents, so I'll keep it short and sharp. It is very clear that China will not be able to sign the ILO convention. Uh, we saw Xi Yinhong, an advisor uh, to really Xi Jinping, um, has stated on the record that that would be impossible to sign onto, that it touches on labor unions, which China, the Chinese Communist Party will not tolerate, and also Xinjiang, which they don't want anyone making any sort of rules and regulations about what's going on in Xinjiang. So I think it was a big mistake for President Ursula von der Leyen to try to spin the Kai as a way to have a lever of influence on labor issues in China. It's clearly a race to the bottom. We see forced labor issues when asked under um, the head of Volkswagen, who has a plant in Xinjiang, was asked uh, by a BBC uh, journalist, can you guarantee that there's no forced labor in your supply chains? And he, he stated that he could not. So clearly European companies are using forced labor. They are unable to clarify. Uh, and it's not just in Xinjiang, it's throughout China, because we know that the labors are, are sent around China to work in various factories. So that was my first uh, point. And then your question about observing labor rules and regulations in Europe, it's, it, it's difficult to assess because we've seen recent articles written about Huawei in Europe, for example, at their headquarters, and uh, that there were several uh, instances of if a Chinese uh, staff member of Huawei married a European, they were immediately sent back to China. So that seems to be a bit of a overstepping um, the bounds of Huawei rules and regulations within Europe. So they're they're very interested in controlling their private lives. So with expansion of Chinese um, labor, uh, workers in Europe, it remains to be seen how these rules and regulations will be uh, followed. And, and well, thank you for that. And, and, and sticking with you, Teresa, I, I mean, given the provision that Chinese workers will now be able to come to the EU for up to three years without restriction, um, are we risking social dumping and distortion in the labor market as well? Well, in the post-COVID-19 economic landscape, we know we're going to have very difficult economic uh, rough ride for European workers. So it's really unclear how this is going to factor into, you know, will, how much will Europeans be competing with Chinese for these positions? And are they really laborers working for these companies or are they here on, for other means? I'm trying to be very diplomatic and, and state that. So we've already seen uh, this type of labor arrangement in Switzerland. Uh, Chinese are allowed to travel to Switzerland, but since Switzerland has access to Schengen, these people travel around Europe and they're looking for uh, Chinese people who the Chinese Communist Party is trying to track down and bring return to China. So uh, this actually makes it far easier for this type of um, surveillance of other Chinese nationals who might be living in Europe, it might be far easier for them to be accessed by this type of agreement. Uh, it remains to be seen. As we know, with the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, the CHI, the annexes have not yet been published, so the devil is always in the detail, and it's difficult to comment on this until we actually have the details. I understand you know, that it was seven years in the making, 35 meetings, and it seems to be a huge success, but I think that the Europeans kind of wasted their leverage. It's very clear that Xi Jinping wanted this finished over the line. So the Europeans had a great deal of leverage, but they, I haven't seen anyone, uh, even the BDI, the German Federation of Industry, is underwhelmed by the agreement. And really, it's designed mostly for the biggest um, beneficiary of in 
investment in China and trade with China is Germany. If you take the next five EU member states combined, it does not equal the type of investments and trade that Germany has. So if you have the German Federation of Industry underwhelmed by this agreement, I would say that the Europeans kind of missed, had a lost opportunity. They're proclaiming that it's the best that we could get under the circumstances. But if Xi Jinping really, really wanted this agreement before Joseph Biden, President Biden came to power on January 20th, I think the European negotiators should have used a little more leverage to get what they wanted out of the Chinese. I understand that they're demandeurs, or they should choose not to sell it in a way that it is not. It's not really um, supporting labor rules and regulations in China, and it's not a lever to improve that. And uh, this idea of the sustainability aspect of it and the green aspect of it. Let's face it, China has signed on to the Paris Climate Agreement five years ago, and with the Belt and Road Initiative, they have built over 300 coal-fired plants, some of them right in Europe's neighborhood. So we're breathing that air, uh, this polluted air. So pretending that they are going to finally implement what they promised to do over five years ago, and that this is a sui generis, a one-of-a-kind type of agreement, I think it's kind of, you know, putting lipstick on a pig. Mm. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that, Teresa. That's very good. Um, so we've got uh, sort of 15, 20 minutes left, and I wanted to move on to the final block, which is more to do with the transatlantic and global impact of, the, of this deal. Um, perhaps I could start with Miriam again. Um, you've been long been involved in transit relations, um, you know, within the IRI. Um, what difference, firstly, do you think that the Biden administration will make as opposed to the Trump one on, on Chinese relations going forward? Thank you very much. Uh, I think that it's very difficult to predict now. I mean, to what extent the Biden administration is going to follow in the steps of the Trump, Trump administration. I think Biden is in a way in a difficult situation because he wants to deviate from Trump as much as possible. On the other hand, as we all know, uh, many of the, of the policies of the Trump administration were actually quite consequent. And, and here I would like to say that unfortunately, the European leaders are unable to see uh, that the Trump administration did uh, certain very, uh, I would say, uh, 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 principled points. And for example, when I was uh, co-drafting co together with Anna the resolution of the European Parliament on, on Hong Kong, we were looking for a list of people who should be on the sanction list of the, of the European Magnitsky Act. And we look into the long list which already exists in the United States uh, where Chinese leaders and, and um, people responsible for the human, re human rights bridges are already listed and sanctioned. So uh, I hope that the Biden administration will be continuing in those steps and will be principled and will not give up to, to what I think the Trump administration has set up, I mean, in terms of human rights, but also in, in terms of security, when the U.S. has engaged with the many EU member states to look for a common solution to the 5G network, for example, I find this uh, approach very exactly what we need, that the democratic world will cooperate uh, more closely to stand up to the big challenge China represents. And I will say, final word, uh, what Teresa already mentioned, I think we have completely, completely uh, ignored the opportunity that uh, with, the, uh, with the Biden administration, after the elections, we could have uh, joined forces with the US, especially, especially when the European leaders were all admiring Biden and were all happy about the change. So they should have waited for the, for the Biden administration to come in and join with them and, and bring in leverage vis-a-vis -vis China, and we have completely failed in that. And I hope that we will wake up and we will strengthen the cooperation with the US, but also with other democratic states, as I said also before, on economic cooperation, but also in the cooperation in terms of uh, human rights and security and defense. Well, thank you, Miriam. Um, Dr. Zim, I mean, when, uh, when Biden was elected, there were a lot of people in Brussels that at least a collective sigh of relief. Yet within seconds, you've got the issue on the Northern Ireland Protocol, you've got the disaster that is the vaccine, and you've got the rushing through of this EU-China thing. Obviously, the EU is the, the US is taking a different approach. Is there a risk that this will widen the division between transatlantic partners? 
Well, it seems that, uh, particularly on the question of China, that the Biden administration is uh, following the, the Trump administration's policy of uh, being very cautious with the approach of China. With China. Uh, there was many people within the campaign during when Biden was running for president who were calling for a, a reset with, the, with, uh, with, with China. And uh, that has simply, you know, many of those individuals did not get seen positions within the administration. So that does seem to be uh, forthcoming. But it's interesting because one of the key priorities that Biden has indicated even during the campaign is to what he called protecting and reviving democracies from around the globe. Around the globe. You know, democracy is still, irrespective of what we like to feel, democracy is still a very relatively new idea and uh, still relatively untested. And what's happening now around the globe is that, uh, you know, we are coming to a stage in which countries and strong men are coming to power through the democratic process and then undermining those same um, uh, same democratic pillars that actually brought them to power and china is a, is a country that's very keen to exploit this you know if you watch chinese media they are very clear to exploit the whole covid situation and they're trying to demonstrate that how effective a single party authoritarian system is in dealing with a crisis such as covid in comparison to europe in comparison to the united states which seem to be in a complete mess even the capital riots in, in washington got significant coverage in Chinese media to demonstrate that look, the democratic model is completely flawed. And we see that this is now an overt policy of China as to try to undermine the democratic process, uh, not just through misinformation, but actually through overt actual um, uh, physical uh, you know, manifestations. And we've seen that in Myanmar as well. You know, they're uh, exporting some technologies there to support the military regime in terms of the crackdown and so on. So this is a complete polar opposite of what the European values actually aspire to and what the Biden administration is actually uh, articulating as its clear strategy in the coming years to support democracy. So I think Europe has a very important decision to make now in terms of its geopolitical future, uh, whether to um, uh, you know, get into bed with a country like China, whose, whose one key purpose is to undermine democracy, or whether to stand with the United States in this fight to preserving and promoting the, the democratic values around the globe. Thank you very much, Dr. Ozzy. So if we just broaden that a little bit, perhaps I bring Theresa back in. Um, at the G7 conference in Cornwall later this year, they're proposing the D10, the Democratic 10. Um, so obviously that is encompassing a number of countries, you know, for, uh, into, into uh, South East Asia as well. How potentially could this cooperation be used to unite against this kind of threat from China? Well, I think that this is a very good idea, but uh, on the sidelines of the of Davos, uh, Chancellor Merkel made a statement that was picked up by the media that she was unwilling to join any sort of Cold War bloc. Uh, the same kind of narrative was reiterated by uh, President Macron during his talk at the Atlantic Council. So you have France and Germany both saying that we will not join any sort of democratic counterbalancing alliance to help shape China's policy choices. And I found that very worrying. And of course it was noted in Washington DC and this made headlines around the world, is Europe a reliable partner? I mean, of course the US has other allies in Japan, South Korea, Australia, um, perhaps even India, the Indo-Pacific is really heating up. And is Europe just going to be co-opted and neutralized by China? Uh, we see growing economic interdependence with this agreement. And we know how this works. Um, when you have an agreement like this, I mean, the comprehensive agreement on investment does kind of lock in uh, already open uh, uh, things that China has done. So I understand why why Europe wants to lock these things in, and that makes sense. But on the other hand, you're actually increasing economic interdependence, and we've seen what happens with that. It's a form of economic coercion, and so it's very difficult. Uh, over the next year, Europe will have to kind of be quiet if they want to get this uh, agreement uh, passed, and that they have to almost be on their best behavior. So they might be reluctant to use the already existing toolboxes that they have. Uh, for example, the FDI screening mechanism, because China has made it clear in other uh, areas that they will punish people if, or governments if they don't behave the way uh, they want them to. Just look at Australia. Australia is kind of the canary in the coal mine. They had a free trade agreement actually with China. They called for uh, an international um, independent 
uh, investigation into the origins of COVID-19 and for that temerity to, to ask for that. They have been punished economically by Beijing. So I think that we should look at that as a warning sign and that the closer uh, European economies become to China, they have more economic coercion. We also see this with the Philippines. We see it with other smaller countries, but we've seen how uh, Beijing is able to utilize the investments of European companies, China never lobbies. They have the heads of these industries lobby on their behalf. So we have that incredible example of Ericsson lobbying to have Huawei in Sweden, and we have you know German car industry lobbying for various things. So I think that uh, this agreement also means closer economic cooperation. We should think about that. And when Europe used to be the conscious on the international stage because of their history, and never again, never again. And this idea that we saw enunciated um, the principled pragmatism. Well, I think we're seeing a lot more pragmatism than principles these days. Mm. Super. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Now, um, we're running out of time, and I wanted to give the last word to Anna Fotiger. Um, but just before I come to you, Anna, um, we were due to be joined by Bernard Guetta, who was a French member of the European Parliament, a journalist with the uh, Liberal Renew uh, uh, Europe group. Unfortunately, he hasn't been able to join us, but he's just sent me um, a quick statement. So I wonder if you don't mind, I'll just quickly read it out uh, before we finish off with Anna. Um, I was particularly interested to have Bernard on this. He's the half-brother of the music producer and songwriter DJ uh, David Guetta, which for us crusty conservatives is pretty cool. So, uh, so hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to get him the next time around, because I think it's, it's always good to hear views from across the, the political spectrum. So here we go. This agreement with China is and will be very divisive amongst us, the members of the European Parliament. Some of us will consider that it is simply impossible to ratify it because it would amount to rewarding the Chinese dictatorship for its negation of the Hong Kong Treaty and the horrific treatment of the Uyghur people. Others will consider that human rights or not, we have to strengthen our economic ties with the world number two economy and guarantee our investments in this country. And between those two positions, there will be a dozen of intermediary reactions, attitudes, and proposals. The debate will be difficult and unclear, but there is one point which could create a very large consensus. This point is that the Parliament and the European Union couldn't ratify this agreement if prior than that, the Chinese authorities had not ratified the international labor conventions, which they said in the agreement they wished to ratify. Therefore, I have a proposal to submit to you Let's adopt a declaration of the Parliament, a declaration of the Conference of the Presidents, or even of the Plenary, telling that in a very few sentences that whatever will be the result of our discussions, whatever will be the majority, and even if the majority stands for the ratification, we will not ratify this agreement before China had ratified the Labour Conventions. Let's be faithful to our principles and dignity. Let's affirm the primacy of our democratic values. And after that, we will examine the pluses and minuses of this text and will decide to reject it or endorsement. Sounds fair enough to me. Um, so we thank Bernard. Sorry he couldn't be with us, um, but uh, but thank uh, thank you for sending that to us, as I think you're watching. Anyway, so um, we are right at the end, so I would just like finally to turn to, to Mrs. Anna Fotiger. Um, got a double question here. I, first of all, wouldn't it be better for the EU to pursue its trade interests with the democratic world first, uh, before addressing China? I'm thinking particularly of Australia, US, and India, etc. And um, and and just finally, you know, what are MEPs doing to hold the Commission to account for this deal? You know, what about the interparliamentary group on China, uh, and what do you kind of expect will come next? Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Allow me to to say that it was extremely interesting statement uh, sent by Bernard. <coughs> Um, uh, I'm afraid that uh, this uh, issue is uh, much broader than ratification of, of the ILO conventions. Of course, I, I having uh, the background of, of Soli Polish Solidarność, I'm very fond of the uh, uh, ILO labor convention and I, I value them. But also, countries like like PRC, like like Russia, Russian Federation, and and others are well known from uh, 
not respecting even a law that uh, was adopted and, and once and, and, and ratified. So it's, uh, unfortunately, it's enough. I would like to say that uh, uh, the CAI has huge geopolitical impact. And from this point of view, Richard, if you if you suggest to 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 approach uh, earlier possibility of broadening the alliance of the West, uh, um, uh, it is uh, extremely important, particularly because uh, experience of countries like Australia, for example. Uh, may be of, of importance also to, 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 to our business community. Because in 2014, Australia already signed bilateral, uh, reciprocal, uh, very, very good, beneficial for both sides uh, agreement. And what happened? Australia started to criticize PRC because of a COVID-19 stance and not properly informing uh, uh, partners ab about the level of pandemics and timing of time of, of pandemics. And then all, all uh, relations uh, were changed. Uh, despite uh, treaty provisions, uh, huge tariffs uh, were imposed, and, and that's the experience. Uh, I'm absolutely sure that uh, China, now with very assertive policies, is going to, to, to pursue its own way. We already, within the EU, call China, call PRC, systemic rival. And with this, uh, with CAI, we, we simply abandon a cautious uh, approach that is necessary if we consider our partner systemic rival. It, of course, does not preclude engagement in a in, 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 uh, variety of, of areas, yet, yet, uh, this kind of, of uh, uh, agreement and, and usually we, t we tend to feel, fulfill our part of obligations with uh, um, autocratic countries, uh, we risk that the other side does not wish to, 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 to fulfill obligations and we have uh, uh, nothing to, 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 to eradicate uh, this situation. Usually, well, having the experience of, of Russia, we are more, more and more, uh, I, I would say, willing to, 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 to just put a blind, uh, turn a blind eye on, on behavior of, of uh, uh, such countries. So, therefore, I'm, I'm against ratification of of this agreement. And uh, one more, one one more. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the agreement was uh, quite hasty, just uh, before inauguration of the new administration in the United States. Uh, um, for seven years, Xi Jinping uh, was uh, reluctant to come to, to, to conclusions uh, of, of the deal, yet uh, he, he decided to, to, to um, accelerate this process, being afraid of possible closer links between uh, both parts of, of Atlantic, so, so uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, community. And this was really bad signal for, for, for our transatlantic partners, uh, not only to US, also to Canada, because uh, also Canada adopted uh, uh, resolutions concerning the genocide in, in, in Xinjiang province. Uh, so I think that it was very bad, uh, not only signal, 
it was was uh, very 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 bad real political message uh, sent uh, transatlantically by EU. We have to 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 change this. Well, thank you very much, Anna. I, you know, I know this is a meaty subject, and we could talk for hours. Uh, there are many issues. It's also got a long way to play. Um, although within that, we all have our our, our part to play. Um, certainly, ECR Party, in its small way, has been trying to stand up for Uyghur rights, uh, and has run a campaign throughout all of last year. We're now running a campaign uh, calling for the boycott of the Beijing 2022 Olympics as well. Um, so we will we will keep the pressure up. Uh, and obviously we'll follow this debate and this discussion closely and I'm sure we'll be able to, to reconvene soon to further discuss. Um, so I'd just like to say a very big thank you on behalf of ECR Party to all of you for joining us today. I think it's been a really interesting discussion. Um, this whole discussion is recorded and will be on our website should anybody wish to review it uh, at our party website. And please, for the audience, do join us for future ECR Party webinars, details of which can be found online. Um, and i just uh, like to thank you once again and wish you all a very pleasant afternoon. Stay safe, and I hope to see you here again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.